Welcome to the Wireless Capture the Flag Gear Talk. Uh, I'm Rick, and this is Rick. I'll be Rick today. And we're uh, we're just a couple of dicks who play with our hardware a lot, so we're going to talk about that. You all get to watch. Oh, uh, you can announce this time. I, I got to announce, to announce it last time. time? Yeah. So um, we decided that maybe if we've been doing this for 12 years, we should become like a company or something. So we officially formed a nonprofit. We are now the RF Hacker Sanctuary. So it's exciting. Home. That means for the rest of the weekend, I expect all of you to arch your back as you walk in the door and scream "Sanctuary!" That would really make my day. So thank you, all of you. Come on, Disney. I'm not that old. Some of you saw this movie. No, okay. Uh, so yeah, we spent a whole lot of our time doing that, and not a whole lot of our time on slides. So that's going to be my excuse. So this asshole over here is Zero Chaos. You may know him from the famous distro Pentu. <laughs> if you don't know him from the famous distro Pentu, it's because it's really not that famous, but it is absolutely amazing. And the basis of a lot of the work that we do, a lot of the work that we do for testing, and a lot of the work we do for teaching, training, etc. cetera. Um, most of the people that are doing well have either used Pentu or are trying to use Pentu over in the Capture the Flag. Um, main reason is radios work all the time, almost all the time. <laughs> it works 100% of the time, at least 80% of the time. Exactly. Um, and the reason that's important is because we're talking about gear, and we're talking about gear for wireless capture the flag, because that's the easy thing to say that's legal that everybody can do. Who in here is a wireless pen tester? Who in here tests more than Bluetooth and Wi-Fi? Who in here tests oh, Wi-Fi? Okay, keep going. Who who in here tests Zigbee? Who in here tests AMR? ADSB? Okay. The reason that we run Pen2 as opposed to some of these other distros, we're going to get a little deeper into it as we go, and actually part of Zero's intro, is he spends like all of the time he's not working for the company that pays him working on this distro so that radios work all the time. Who's had trouble loading, you know, a driver in anything but Windows or Mac? Yeah, wireless drivers suck. Yeah. Who's tried to load the Realtek driver by themselves with the new AC card? Any of you have a smile on your face right now? Nope, just the people with their hands down laughing at you. And, yep, and, that's exactly right. And those that got it working, who had the actual driver working with full injection and the ability to sniff? with 90% or better efficiency when you're getting your packets. Okay, so some of what we are going to do today is talk about not just the gear, because the gear is really cool and we, we have a lot of it. I mean, uh, what, 8 to 10, 15 radios in, at any one time in our bags, and I think the bag of antennas I carry weighs more than some of your backpacks. But we use that because we like how these radios work in certain circumstances. Um, there aren't a lot of people that raised their hand that said that they're Wi-Fi pen testers or Bluetooth pen testers. One of the things we push people to do as best as we can is to start being RF pen testers because there's a lot of other stuff as we're going to discuss in this talk and then kind of as we freeform a little bit, there's a lot more signals out there that can make somebody very vulnerable. So if you're a bad guy and you're attacking, red team, blue team, purple team, I don't care, yellow team, if you're attacking a network, you need a vulnerability to get in. Firewalls are pretty good. How many people have had to beat an IPS before over WIPs, over wireless? It's because there aren't that many that are any good. So that's the really way too long uh, intro to Rick. Yeah, sure, I'll be me now. Oh, man. Don't even read it. Oh, can I, can I, can I read oh, the whole thing? It's word for word. And watch everybody leave. They're going to fall asleep. Hey, uh, but seriously... This, this guy has been doing wireless since uh, wireless wasn't even cool, and he's part of the crew that has made it cool. Um, I'll never forget my introduction to him of, yeah, I know what he looks like, but he really knows what he's doing. And uh, <laughs> he really explains all of it, right? So he's been doing this since, what was it, DEF CON 10? 10. And uh, competing in the wireless competitions and kind of helped found the wireless village and did found the wireless capture the flag. So. Um, yeah, he looks like he's been around the block because he has, and yeah, we should definitely go over some of that experience. So one of my favorite parts of all of RF and wireless is finding things. So we've really gone way out of our way, and we apologize to the contestants. In fact, I, 
I let them go home early last night, which was really weird of me because I was like, hey, it's 11 o'clock, go home. If you can't find a rogue device, you can't do RF anything. If you don't know where it is and you can't get close enough to inject into it, take, you know, take down the, the packets that are coming from it or find the signal, you're not close enough to do the work you're trying to do. So let's just say, you know, easy example, there's a rogue access point in a 100,000 square foot floor in New York City on the 35th floor. Go. Who would feel relatively comfortable going and finding that access point? Okay, what would you do? I'm gonna, I am going to call on people in the city in the stand, so you know, feel free to not raise your hand if you don't care. What would you do? Okay, so he said use a spectrum analyzer, good answer, or a Wi-Fi radio and walk around and find it. One of the things we try and teach as best as we can is a repeatable process for everything we do. By having a repeatable process, I know what appears to be rogue versus what appears to be real versus what appears to be broken. And by knowing that, we have the ability to find things. Because typically, if somebody's going to quick plant something, they're going to use a Raspberry Pi, they're going to use a NUC, they're going to use a rogue access point of some sort. And uh, hey, uh, hey, Scoot, wave to everybody. How did your implant go last night? They attempted to put an implant in the village, and they did a really good job of masking it, and had we not been truly looking for things, we wouldn't have found it. He took the shell. Do you mind if I tell this story? Okay. He took, <laughs> Do we he took the shell mind? of an Aruba device. Uh, the Aruba devices aren't here. You know those, those white Aruba access points that are all over the place? Well, he took the shell of one of those, hollowed it out, and put a Raspberry Pi inside. He didn't encrypt it. But he put a Raspberry Pi inside trying to capture more information. Well, by doing that, he hit a device, it was coming over RF, and it was actually doing a really good job, but it was loud. So Spectrum Analyzer, great answer. The problem is, if somebody's only trying to attack an office and they do it correctly, your spec and's only going to find it if you get close enough to where that signal is. So working with people on how to make really shitty antennas, hey Wasabi, you have your shitty antenna anywhere? Teaching people how to make really shitty antennas so that when you're really close to a signal, you know you're, you know you're right on top of it. Oh, look at that. We happen to have it. <laughs> SMA connector into a BNC connector with a paper clip and hot glue. It, it is also classified as a weapon at TSA, so be careful. Why does this work? Somebody, why does it work? What? One more time? Exactly. All it's doing is taking the energy coming out of the radio and dispersing it. It's not doing jack and shit to help you with a good signal. But what it's doing is it's going to alert you when a signal's close. Hence why we do the wireless capture the flag and the CTF and we make people go find stuff. But we don't just stop at Wi-Fi, we move across the spectrum and that's kind of how we're going to get into this a little bit. I'm going to let you talk to this next one because this is pretty. Oh, this is my favorite part because he does most of the work. Uh, <laughs> so we build this thing that we have to carry around with us. So I, I want to say half of my testing is literally how do we cram all of this stuff together in a very tight space. So the, the box on the right is actually the box that we're using to run the capture the flag right now. And it's all of the transmissions more or less uh, replicated out. So we've got 20 Wi-Fi radios in it. We've got four RF cats, and we've got three Blade RFs with amplifiers, and all of that stuff has to fit in there and be powered in there. And why did we pick those things, and how did we get them to fit, and oh my goodness, how did the NUC not fall over with 50 uh, USB devices on it? So the, the testing and the building of this stuff is really what allows you to, to figure out how all of this works. Uh, just making the kit on the left, uh, the kit on the left is a, a Kismet fully loaded box, basically. That's actually a picture of us on the high roller on Tuesday. Uh, we took that while uh, up in the air over Vegas co uh, collecting everything. Security did not like us at they all. They let us on. They, they let us on. during the ride that they didn't like us. And uh, The part yeah. of that picture that's cut out is me handcuffed to that kit, which also we have a video of going through yeah, security. Yeah, we have a two-minute video of security checking it out. He never took off the handcuffs, and they never said anything about it, and I almost peed. Uh, 
So inside of that box, we actually have six RTL SDRs tuned to different frequencies, picking up ADSB, uh, car clickers, uh, tires driving by, all kinds of weird stuff. We've also got three Wi-Fi radios, two Bluetooth radios, two Zigbee, one 2.4, one 900. Uh, we've got two mouse jack dongles and uh, GPS. And I think that's about it. But just building that kit, we found several bugs in Kismet. We found several bugs in RTL 433. Uh, we found several bugs in the Linux kernel that we've been spending time reporting and trying to get fixed so that this device, uh, which was a four core processor running with a load of 12 when we started, uh, actually got down to a load of about three when we were done and functioned, rather than all of the devices falling off of the bus. And only one time did the, the power supply uh, crap itself and do a wide band jamming attack before yeah, that finally was fun. failing. Driving, so. driving down the road and I called Zero and I was like, hey dude, what could possibly be messing with our GPS, the satellite radio, and our phones. We're like, um, it's all passive. We got to where we were going and realized that there was a five watt or a five amp uh, power supply that literally was shitting the bed all over the place. So we found a, a absolute denial of service attack on a car. Just take a really bad Chinese five amp uh, 12 volt power supply and just cut the wire a little bit. Apparently everything goes to hell and back. Um, and he did gloss over that a lot. Um, I know this uh, is scheduled as a two-hour talk. It may or may not be two hours. Um, we've got uh, some folks here to help us out with some of the other areas that they are much, much, much smarter than us in. Um, but I will say that we are going to go into each one of those, and we're going to talk through how the testing of Kismet went, how the testing of Linux went, and the testing of USB buses. I know more about USB buses than I ever wanted to know. Um, and the fact that some of these really crappy computers can do a really good job. So that's kind of how this is going to work. We're going to talk to you guys about what exists and what can be done, but also how we can test, because in some places where you may go, some of you may not be native to a place where Amazon can deliver in an hour and a half like I am, where you may only get this radio and this radio and this radio, or you may be in another country where you can only have these three things. Showing you how to test them, to get the absolute most out of them is going to make you more efficient as you're trying to do this work. Um, and the other piece that I wanted to really highlight on, so um, Red Team, uh, the Red Team Alliance has worked with us very closely um, and the core group. Um, is Babic over there? Babic. Babic. Yep. Brett. Brett, stand up and represent your company. Brett, Just wave stand, to everybody. Stand up and say hi. The Thank guy, you. That gentleman in the TSA uh, security <laughs> uniform, he's not TSA. Um, well, that, I mean, he could be. If I give you $5, will you pretend to be the TSA? That box in the bottom they've created for us, um, it, working in conjunction with us for the capture of the flag. RFID is also an extremely important piece of this. If you've ever done, so we, we talked wireless. Who's a physical pen tester? Who's used an under the door tool? Who knows what a DDT is? Who has a lockpick set on them right now? <laughs> there we go. Who's used those lock picks in the last three hours? Okay, good. So that kit is a full on, oh, there it goes. Aw, it yeah, went away. Already. And it's really pretty. Hey, did they leave the scream grab here? There we go. Did anybody check? So uh, the, uh, that box at the bottom is literally a building in a box. There are four different types of access control cards running into a single controller with a pie in the background taking in all the information and handing out flags. If you haven't seen it yet, the thing over there on the end of the table that makes you look like the devil is one of the coolest access control capture the flag style devices that I think's ever been built. And I know uh, Babic's not here, but one of his representatives is. Can you wave, raise your hand there, he, Dave? He already he waved. I know, but I'm making Dave wave too because he's standing oh, there that, in that his is. ramen shirt, which I absolutely love. Um, they do some amazing RFID work, and they've helped us tremendously to really take this up to another level. Um, and I just you know want to thank them for partnering with us. But from a learning perspective, having the ability to have that many readers in one place is something that we're going to adopt into our CTF. And that type of thing is going to start traveling with us thanks to them. And we're going to just keep saying thank you to them for, for a while as it goes. We love you too. <laughs> um, so those are the three pieces. So from this set of, of devices, 
We've literally hit from 316? 315 to 6 gig, and all of the low frequency and high frequency cards that exist in three Pelican cases that we can travel just about anywhere with. Now, I wouldn't expect anybody else to do that insanity because that's about a year's worth of work, but the testing the methodology... Good. You, can, you can travel with the Kismet box pretty easy. That's true. The technology and the testing that goes into that is really what we want to we impart on you. So, moving on. Um, this is a PSA. Please stay out of the casinos with any radios that you may have. They do put you in jail. The jail is underneath of this building. It's very big, and you're not getting out without any bruises. And, by the way, if you came into this room, who has an Apple phone? Don't raise your hand if you don't want to. If you have your Bluetooth on, this isn't a burner phone discussion. This isn't a Apple versus Android discussion. Please turn your Bluetooth off. You are ridiculously vulnerable to a whole lot of things. I am an Apple user when it comes to phones. I have a watch. It is in watch mode. You know what it's doing? It's being a watch. Cool. Um, but my phone has Bluetooth off. The reason behind that is Apple has not fixed the vulnerability that has come out with Apple BLE. And uh, BLE? Uh, we'll have hopefully a demo up of that tomorrow um, and start talking to people about their phones. But essentially, from your Bluetooth, your phone number, the power of your phone, the Wi-Fi, help me here, what else? Yeah, Version wi number. State, if the screen's on, if the screen's locked, uh, phone number, yeah. All can be pulled off Bluetooth. Yeah. SSID so very, you're connected to oh right yeah, now. SSID. Yeah, SSID. So very discreetly, no, no embarrassment here, just turn your Bluetooth off if you have an Apple device. And that's an iPad, iPhone, iPod, i, Enema, I don't know. Um, but Apple leaves those on for watches, for pencils, for connectivity to all kinds of things. Just turn it off, please, because all your RF does belong to us, and we've been capturing since we got here. We're going to review all that when we get home. We're going to look at it, and we're going to say, huh, this dude had his uh, Bluetooth on, and this lady had this on, and moving on. Yeah. God, you read that. Yay. Okay. So how do we test radios? This is actually a really, really wild thing. Um, first, we buy lots and lots of radios. And then we buy lots and lots of USB hubs. Mostly USB because it's so much easier than taking apart laptops. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, companies started introducing BIOS uh, lockouts to stop you from putting in Wi-Fi cards that um, they didn't sell. And that sucks because you had to go and customize your BIOS and do those kinds of things. And at that point, the community pretty much said, F all this, we're just going to use USB stuff. So um, we just started doing USB stuff. And, and it's not a big deal when you put eight radios in a box and try to play with them. It is a pretty big deal when you put 30 in. Um, so if you go back and talk to our good friend Alex, who makes uh, a whole bunch of crazy radio stuff that's really awesome. Hey, Alex, stand up and raise your hand and put that thing down. Yeah, stop waving that around. The casino is going to stop you. Alex, Alex, raise your hand. Wave high. Stand up. And hold up one of your big... Yeah, oh, put God. that down, please. Put that down. <laughs> don't, don't point that put at Put that down. Please, please put that down. Pick up the other thing with all the radios on it. Yeah, so Alex makes these devices with... No, nope, those are PCI. antennas, Alex. Radios. No, that's, that's PCI. That's PCI radios. And okay, okay. USB one, too. Okay. So he actually discovered, he was the first one of us to figure out that um, the new Intel USB 3 chips could only handle 11 Wi-Fi cards at a time, and the 12th one didn't work. Um, we figured that out just after him when we plugged uh, 12 Wi-Fi cards into our NUC, and it didn't work. Uh, the part where we actually figured it out first is that we bought a newer NUC, and the, uh, the newer USB controller could handle more. So uh, my current record is 31. I've got 31 connected to my test box at home, which um, is, I'm actually like out of outlets and spaces to put things in the little corner where I do my testing. So I have to like, I don't know, buy a table or something to keep going. Um, so you find the weirdest things when you test this stuff. Um, the things that you never expected to find be the problem are the problem. So the, the Realtek driver was released last year about this time. New 8011AC, monitor mode, proper injection, theoretically. Uh, the driver crashed horrifically. And so we started testing. So I went onto Amazon and I bought every single Wi-Fi card that had the Realtek chipset to see which one was any good. Um, lots of money later, I plugged them all into my system and realized it didn't work. 
and then I plugged it into multiple systems and started spreading out load because stupid limitations. And then we bought new NUCs and fixed that problem. But the point is, is you find really weird issues when you go to test these things. Um, at the time, I was testing with a tool called Kismet Shootout. And what Kismet Shootout does is it actually, uh, you give Kismet all of the Wi-Fi cards, and then you say, put them all on channel one, or channel two, or channel six, or whatever. And then it counts how many packets are seen. That's all it does, it counts how many packets each device sees. And that allows me to say, okay, if this device sees this many packets, but this device only sees 86% of those packets, thereby, this one's better. So I connect a whole bunch of um, Wi-Fi cards to the system at once, I put them on different channels, and I meter them against each other to see who picks up the most packets. Okay. Once I get a fairly good cream, you know, there's these 10 are pretty decent, I go through and I do injection testing. Go through with air crack and I say, okay, does this one work, does this one work, does this one work? And it's actually really interesting to find out that like the minor differences in the chipsets often make one suck yeah. and one work great. Or even worse, like some of them receive really well and they can't transmit for crap. Uh, you know, they'll go three feet, but they just don't have a good radio chain on the TX side and they don't go very far at all. So um, the ones that we're using in our kit are actually TP-Link T2Us and they totally go a solid 35 feet. I mean, just absolutely garbage on the transmit and pretty much on the receive side. But all we do is we put them right next to each other and we have this little area for capture the flag and that's as far as they need to go. And they're the tiniest thing on earth. Yeah, every, every time we do testing, Rick's like, did you get it within like 16 feet? I was like, well, yeah. He's like, good enough. All right, we're moving on. Yeah, so the ones we actually like are actually the uh, Alpha 036 ACMs. They're a monster card. They have two antenna connectors to mount the side. They have these giant I surrender antennas on top of them, and they're, they're much longer range. They're much better transmit power, but they're enormous, and we didn't want that kind of thing in our kit. So we actually go through and do testing to see that kind of level. Like, okay, this is good enough for what we are doing, but these are the ones that we recommend for, like, putting in your kit and going out and doing whatever. So one of the big things that Rick said, but probably didn't hit on, so I'm doing the whole, this might be on the test later, is you've got to log everything. If you're not logging, you're not getting errors, you're not getting packet captures, you're not getting data, you're not getting transmissions. You're not getting anything if you just plug a radio in and say, oh, this one works, this one doesn't. You need empirical data to be able to go back to. Now, it doesn't mean you've got the best of the best or the worst of the worst, it means that you have your own level of, of subjective uh, quantity, you know, identification that says this is one, this is two, this is three, this is seven. At that point, you know that what you have is the best that you have when you're going out to do whatever it is you're trying to do. And that could be literally going to the beach and wanting to have your laptop connect to the Wi-Fi or getting on a boat and having your, your, your Wi-Fi connect to the dock or you're doing a full-on, you know, red team where you need radios involved and you need to be able to get them from the parking lot. And so I know this radio is great. It's got SMA connectors, so I can hit, you know, I can use my panel antenna and I can hit 150 yards solid with injection. But until you've tested and you've gotten the empirical data, you really can't say that. What we find the most, and we tell people in the CTF, because we want them to take this back into their real world, if you don't test your stuff, you don't know what it does. How many of you have ever played in any type of CTF? A few people did, over there should raise their hand. Did you spend a week beforehand testing your equipment to know exactly how it's supposed to react? Nobody ever does. Because every time we get there, they're like, oh, my kernel's broken. Oh, I have to update. Do you have internet so I can update? I didn't check this driver. Which kernel is this? Tools like Kismet and some of the others that are very helpful in data collection literally update, what, every six hours? I mean, at the long side. <laughs> Dragon doesn't even sleep, I don't think. I think he's a I mean, robot. They're updating the software that you're relying on to do what you're trying to do hourly. Some of you may or may not have tested your stuff yearly. Do you guys go to more than one con a year? <laughs> How often do you test your stuff to know how it's supposed to react, to know what the baseline is, so when something's different, you know it changed? Every day, Rick. Well, you, yeah, day. But, but we're idiots. 
Every single day. Every, totally. The kids are shootouts running at my house right now. <laughs> It's a long-term test. Again, we've got ends of the spectrum. We're all on the spectrum. We're here. But we've got ends of the spectrum. We've got the I test shit, and oh my god, I'm, I'm going out tomorrow. Let me get a laptop at Fry's, throw a new hard drive in it, and throw a live distro on it. So part of this, and again, hey, good segue, by accident, platform selection. You're going to work or you're going to CTF, and you guys decide which scenario you want to sit in. You need something to type on. I don't know how many people we've had come into the CTF and be like, hey, I want to play. What do I need? Well, you need a radio and a laptop and Bluetooth. laptop at home. I, oh, I, I, didn't bring a, I didn't bring a laptop. Well, what do you want to do? Well, I want to learn. Well, why didn't you bring a laptop? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to hold a paper clip in my teeth. And I'm going to stand up on my soapbox for a second. Um, who read all the stuff coming out on Twitter about the burner phones for DEF CON? Who read all the stuff about turn off all your radios, turn off your Wi-Fi, turn off your Bluetooth, hide your kids, hide your wife, they're coming to get you, right? Okay. Who's been to Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, or a Panera in the last six months? Okay. Who did all this worry before they went to Starbucks, Panera, or Dunkin' Donuts? Right? Right. And you should. Who was at work last week or the week before because it's summertime and was worried about this? Huh? You work at, uh, you're a developer, huh? He, he turns off his phone before. <laughs> you're either a writer or a man. developer. <laughs> okay. So where your protection posture is for your device when you take it anywhere should not matter if you're coming to DEF CON, which, by the way, in the last way too many years, geez a whiz, 17 years, it's gotten a lot easier. You used to not be able to come to DEF CON with something that had a device that you connected to anything else with. Now, you could have a Windows XP box online at DEF CON right now and you might make it home fine. It's different, but everybody worries about it. They worry about, the Vegas worries about it, they worry about Black Hat, they worry about DEF CON. Well, I promise you that you have more issues if you're working in, and I'm just going to name three cities randomly, LA, New York, and Baltimore, and DC, that's four. You have more to worry about going into a Starbucks or a Panera and connecting to their Wi-Fi than you do coming to DEF CON. How often are you stressed out about going to Panera or Starbucks or the train station or wherever? Just let that settle in for a second. This is why testing and knowing what your stuff does matters. Yeah, have you uh, seen the bars at night? The good hackers are all way too drunk to be hacking you right now. All right, I'm stepping on my soapbox. We're going to talk about platform selection because Woo! there are some platforms to select from. Rick, do this you know is the a nice platform? Do you know thirty inches? There, we're a little biased here. The the dude yeah. that creates one of those operating systems is here, um, and this is Bill Gates. I'd like to welcome. Hey. Okay, uh, Actually, um, uh, I'd like to talk to you about developers, 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 <laughs> developers. You, you got it. You got it. There we go. All right. Um, I like this. You're perfect <laughs> for the front the row. He hasn't heard these jokes before. He hasn't. <laughs> They're funny for us. All right. Windows is an operating system. Do we all agree? Yeah. How many have to use Windows? Okay. Yeah, it's either because Office 365 sucks, or because OpenOffice doesn't quite work well, or because you were given a laptop at work to use Windows. There are tools that Windows works with. I can name five or six off the top of my head. There's Spike, there's uh, Insider, there's Me uh, MetaGeek's entire suite of stuff. Um, there's, a, there's a sniffing program, I can't remember what it's called anymore. Win PCAP? Win PCAP, yeah, but and you have the, to have the right driver and the right radio. Air PCAP? And I think I just mentioned $65,000 worth of equipment. So you, ha you have to pay for Windows stuff, but it's not bad. It's gooey, it's pretty, it's, you know, I can give this to a CXO and say, hey, here's, here's your stuff, here's your heat maps. But for doing this type of stuff we do, it's not ideal. And it's not ideal because I can't manipulate the way that I'm going to affect the physics of the RF. Virtual machines are cool, who uses them? Ever tried to do RF over a VM with EIEIO 
Okay? 80% of you can say yes, and it worked fine, and the other 20% can say, oh my God, why doesn't it work? And the answer is, you will never know. So, VMs are fabulous until they don't work, and then you, you, there's nothing you can do about it. So, yes. Oh. There is an operating system missing from this screen. Which is it? Crapple. Crapple. Okay. Steve died. Moment of silence. Okay. Moving on. So he died, and the entire vision of Apple changed when it came to usability of their, of their operating systems. Five, six, twelve, twelve years ago? God. Kahuna and I. Uh, we gave a talk, and we gave a talk on wireless. We gave a talk on wireless using VMs using Apple. Because Apple at that time actually had kernel-ish type stuff. Rick still hated it. But yep. it had kernel-ish type stuff. It had the ability to write to the HAL more appropriately. It had the ability to run three or four VMs. It had the ability to pass that data through. Well, things have changed. It doesn't anymore. In fact, there are articles out there about USB 2 to USB 3 conversion on Apple and contention on the USB bus because of the screen and the way the Wi-Fi works to make Apple almost unusable. So in the last two or three years, in this type of talk we've given, we've taken Apple off the list. It is a viable operating system if you have to use Office. It is a viable operating system for Adobe or development or music or I'm sure you know there are tons of people that have real good uses for it. In this space, it's not ideal. The cost of an Apple outweighs the absolute horror that you have to go through to make it work. So we move on to Raspberry Pi. I'm going to skip over the middle one. Yes. Yeah. Lau. Right. So the question is like doing, doing separate boots on it. So it's not the hardware on Mac that's necessarily the problem, although they tend to implement the standard in their own special way. The, we're talking about the operating system itself. So the, the, we're skipping over pen two in the middle, but the point is any hardware that you can live boot into Linux, the answer is do that, right? Even if you don't want to reinstall your operating system and kill your Windows box or kill your Mac box, if you can boot into Linux, you can do all this stuff with direct access to the hardware, and if you're super spooked about that, just yank the hard drive before you do it. Probably not with a magnetic screwdriver, but you get my point. You can <laughs> easily enough just not format your hard drive if you don't want to do that, and you can do all of these things and save to a USB stick and it's no big deal. But the ease of use with Linux, uh, aside from you know trying to actually use Linux, the tools are there and the tools roughly work as well as open source ever works. And the support's there as much as open source ever has support. But to get these things, the only way you're going to do it is with Linux or with millions of dollars. You can buy a ten dollars to $15,000 Bluetooth sniffer or you can buy an Ubertooth One. And they both do exactly the same thing. One works in Windows, and the other pretty much doesn't work in Windows. Right. But you can choose. Do I want to run Linux, or do I have $10,000 extra dollars laying around? And if the answer is the second one, could you please be a sponsor? <laughs> Did I mention we're a nonprofit now? Um, so Raspberry Pi is on there. Raspberry Pi is on there because Raspberry Pi runs Linux. It'll run Gentoo. It'll run Debian. It'll run Raspbian. It'll run a whole lot of operating systems. It'll run Kali. It'll run Cali. It'll run NetHunter. Cali? No, no, Cali, Cali. Cali, With, Cali? All, the, with oh. all the next mod well, patches and everything included. Well, we haven't gotten there yet, but Windows runs Cali too. Yeah. Cali's, Cali's an operating system. All too. right. So Raspberry Pi. So as a dropper, as a leave behind, as a pass through, as a bridge, Raspberry Pis do a great job because if you lose it, you lost 35 bucks. I don't care what your budget is. People care about the bottom line. Now, there's a team that will be made, you know, not named right now because Scoot left, um, that left a Raspberry Pi on site. They left it on site unencrypted. So whoever found it was able to pull all their data off and look at it and review what they were doing. Adversary, red team, pen test, or whatever have you, we're able to pull everything you did off that information. You guys can sit down. There are seats. We don't bite. I promise. Lots right. of them up front. We both um, showered this morning. We did. Separately. We did. Separately. I, well, sort of. Wasabi uh, did yeah, walk Wasabi in Wasabi kind of was in the middle, but <laughs> that's a different um, story. So, so the fact that we have the ability to take a 35, okay, we've got what, Pi 4s now, they're 50 bucks. But 
that's a, an nth of a percentage of the cost of a lot of these engagements. Raspberry Pi W, they, what's their, what are they, 10 bucks, 12 bucks now? You have the ability to do a lot of the things we're going to talk about, and we're going to back them 100%, but it's a tool, not your main device. If you need a laptop to do work, use a laptop or a computer. Don't use a leave behind or a dropper to do the work that a laptop should do. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Rick was talking about workloads a little bit, a little bit ago. As a single source server that you're leaving in as an RF forwarder, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, have whatever have you, they work great. They're not going to be your primary OS or your primary device. Yeah, again, going back to the if you didn't test it first, it doesn't work. Um, we've got only like 18 things plugged into the Kismet box, and that compute stick is chugging real, real hard. That's based on a design from much earlier where I built a seven radio rig, <laughs> and I built it in a, a clipboard. clipboard with two lithium ion batteries that did not look like a bomb at all, and we snuck onto a trolley and sniffed a bunch of sea level traffic and then got interviewed about it, but that one ran for a total of five minutes before the RAM completely filled up and the box decided to crash because it couldn't write to the disk fast enough to put the captures on. Ran all the radios, great. Yeah. No problems there. Captured lots and lots of data really fast. Uh, battery, battery, uh, battery was great. hours we, of battery life on I that I charged rig. my phone off the battery after we were done. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Great. But uh, yeah, five minutes, yeah. five minutes of capture time and then the RAM was full. Uh, bigger RAM would not have helped me there. No. Uh, sometimes you just, you run into these weird problems and it's really important to test these things because the, the thing you don't expect to break is always what breaks. All of our challenges pretty much are running and our status page is broken. So people keep coming over to us saying, the challenge isn't running. How do you know? Scoreboard says it's not running. Like, well, uh, did you look in the air? All of them are up. Oh. Yeah, so it's always the thing that you wish was simple that breaks and the complex stuff is what works fine. Hey, Blunderbuss, you're still in third. Oh. Sorry, just had to. Um, so. We're doing this in a weird order on purpose. Um, we talk, if you've ever heard us, who's ever listened to us travel on ever? Anyone? Okay. Wow. You, this back. counts now. This counts now. <laughs> um, so Cali is a great operating system. Cali has an absolute place in the world. Oh. <laughs> Cali has a place in the world. But every operating system and every device that those operating systems are on are tools. Um, I am really, really, really bad with physical tools. My father-in-law can build a mansion with like Home Depot. If I go to Home Depot and buy a hammer, I've got three broken thumbs, yes, three, and the nail never went in. But it's the same tool used by a different person. People that are really good at wired pen testing, reverse engineering, database exploitation, web exploitation, general networking stuff, or anything that, God love him, Dave Kennedy has written, or has, his team has written. Just don't read the code, good God. Works amazingly in Kali. So if that's your gig and that's what you're doing, Kali is a great operating system. Try and do wireless work and be really effective using Kali. The difference between, and again, we're going back to logs, empirical data, the difference and the loss, the loss in packets with Kali to pen to are enormous. So many, many times we will disparage Kali. We have built stickers and written stickers that say, hey, ha, 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 you use Kali, ha, you suck. Um, but because they're doing the capture the flag, and we absolutely 100% of the time denote that on the sticker or the discussion that we're having. If you're doing wireless work, these are going to be your problems. We could have a flame war in Linux on Debian versus Slack versus Gen2 versus uh, BSD. Immediately we, following this talk, we can meet over there. Yeah, we can meet over there. We'll have an absolute flame war. But until you can tell me in this instance, using this device, using this type of test, I hate this operating system, I still am going to call bullshit on you. Because until you've done that, Windows is the right tool for certain things. Mac is the right tool for certain things. All right, you've gone too far. Don't we have another slide? Nope. I'm pretty sure we do. Nope. No, this Please. is it. This is the last slide. Please. So 
I want you to talk about pen too. So, oh, yeah, go ahead. I like pen too. It's a lot of fun. So the truth is, is um, when you're using a live CD, and the next slide, the only thing that matters is, does the tool I'm trying to run work? Does the device I'm plugging in work? It doesn't matter what the OS base is. It doesn't matter what schmuck put it together. It only matters, does this work right now, this second? And if you're trying to install with Pentu, the answer is probably 80% it doesn't. But if you're trying to use any of the tools, it absolutely does work. And we spend an enormous amount of time testing our own stuff, and we use Pentu to test it, which means that we know for a fact that you can break the challenges with the hardware using Pentu. Um, when you choose what operating system to install, I always suggest that you install the one that you ask the least stupid questions about. If that happens to be Pentu, that's great, and I would love to support you. But the truth is, is using Pentu, which is based on Gen 2, is enormously painful for new Linux users. The learning curve is straight backwards. <laughs> it is, it is so if, if this is a normal learning curve, <laughs> Pentu is this way. Yeah. No joke. Yeah, absolutely. So learning to use Linux. I started on Red Hat. I did. I spent two years on Red Hat, and then I'm like, oh my god, why does this never do what I want it to do? And the guy I was working with on the Entercat project's like, oh, I use Gen 2. It's the only way I can That's make it work. That's yummy. And then I just, now I'm on Gen 2 forever. Go Gen 2. Uh, but the truth is, it is painful to use sometimes when you are trying to do updates and reconfiguring the system and learning how to make Linux work. So if you have no idea how Linux works and you want the pain, by all means, I will help you. If you want to start with something a little gentler, honestly, using Debian or Ubuntu, learning how Linux works, or something based on set operating systems, even Kali, you can learn how Linux works. And when you're a little more comfortable with that, something that's a lot more complex is, is worth it sometimes. So the next slide, please do not go out and buy these tools. We've had this talk before, and the next thing I know, three days later, I went to Hacker Warehouse, which, by the way, is phenomenal, and they've got everything. But I went to Hacker Warehouse, and I bought all these things. I'm a pen tester now, right? I went to Home Depot. I bought a saw, a hammer, a jigsaw, and some nails. Can I build a house? Hell no. I bought a monocle. Now I'm a millionaire. Yes. Yes, Monopoly boy. <laughs> so the Ubertooth is a great tool for portions of Bluetooth that you need it for. Alpha radios are phenomenal if they have the right chipset. If you can find the TP-Link TLWN722N version 1, it's golden. It's about 13 bucks, and it will last for years. It's a $13 Wi-Fi radio that in 2.4 gigahertz will do everything you need it to do. And I see you all taking pictures. Don't go buy all this because you can't buy some of it. Um, Actually, but can't buy most of it anymore. But version one is amazing. Version two, they change the chipset. It doesn't inject. It's worthless. HackRF, Mike Osman makes an amazing, cap a capable software-defined radio. There are better, but they're more expensive. There are worse, and they're cheaper, but they may do exactly what you want them to do. The global stat. BU-353 GPS is amazing. We're not even using them. We're using the Block 7s because they do a better job, they're smaller, and they make better connections. Crazy Radio PA, who knows what that does? By the end of this talk, you're going to love these and you're going to go buy them. Uh, the Crazy Radio PA is the mouse jack attack. Who's heard of that? Oh, okay, we have to talk about mouse jack a little bit. So for those of you who know it, just sit back and laugh at everybody else. The Senna UD100 is an amazing Bluetooth radio. But one of our guys who does a ton of work, and I'm going to plug him real quick. Woody, are you over there? Yep. He can't hear low, low frequency stuff because he's been blown up too Woody. many times. Woody. Woody. Hey, Woody. Hey, Woody. Hey, it worked. See? We have a high frequency. We can hear him. Woody has done a crap ton of Bluetooth testing and has pointed us in some directions on Bluetooth radios that are different from the UD100. He says he sees like 10 times more things in the same room. So, hey, cool, let's work with this. USB powered hubs. You'd think this was a really just easy, simple, no worries, I'm gonna go buy a USB hub. How many have we burned up? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like literally melted, only a few, but most of them break really quick. The ones that don't break usually don't actually fill all the ports. 
because so I've got a seven port at home that's got three of those TP yeah. links in it because you can't actually fit them next to each other. Um, most USB hubs are awful, both in throughput and in latency and in heat and in the fact that they just generally break. So, um, for instance, if you look in our box, which we encourage you to look but not touch, you'll see two different kinds of hubs. We've got one where they're really, really close to each other, and we've got the new model of same said hub where they're actually spaced out enough that you can put devices in every friggin' port. If you're taking notes, the Vantec 10-port USB 3 hub is absolutely amazing. It's it is aluminum. It's the size of your forearm, but... It's not that big. Yeah. It's um, it's all aluminum. It's made for bit miners, and it disperses heat phenomenally, and it's got full bandwidth. So, even something as simple as going to Fry's or on Amazon or or Micro Center and finding a USB hub, even that is something we test, and we're going to talk through some of this testing as we go through this. Again, we're at forty-eight minutes of a two-hour talk. Can we talk for two hours? I think we can talk for like six. I think we? you could probably talk for two hours. I probably could talk for two hours. I'm going to close, though. It might be now. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Um, USB to Ethernet controller. If you've bought a new generation laptop that is decent, how many USB ports do you have? One? Two? All USB-C? None. Love it. Yeah. That shit sucks. But you have to be able to plug other things into it because, you know, we talk about how secure Wi-Fi is, but if you're not using client certs and server certs, validating both and having no wild cards and having everything signed, and having your IT department write a GPO that gives you WPA2 only in cert form, you're not really secure using Wi-Fi. How many years has DEF CON's Wi-Fi gone down because of us? I mean, all the way down or just we stole all the passwords? Well, both. I mean, most of the time they don't even notice. The knock hates us, and we love them, and they hate us, and we love them. Um, I want it on record that we love them, um, and we try and help. But essentially, every time they create a network, they implement it properly. Who's a sysadmin in the room? Don't. It's okay to raise your hand if you are. Who's implemented Wi-Fi and done it correctly and dealt with the absolute hell of dealing with mutual cert authentication and validation? and the cert chain, and all of, of everything that goes with that. I connect my GPD to my phone's hotspot at work, so I don't have to do that. Right. Because people go around it. So again, if you're not going with the full compliance of what, wow, this is going flat quick. The full compliance of what your enterprise is doing, you're not secure any other time if you're still following the same rules. So. USB to Ethernet controller. If you don't use Wi-Fi, you got to use Ethernet. We were testing radios in the room before this to get ready for this talk and the CTF and you guys because, you know, DEF CON's a bunch of assholes that try and break everything. And the end goal was Rick had at least one gigabit Ethernet over USB 3 device that's cut in half with his pliers because I was de him with my handheld radio. Does anybody know what frequency uh, USB works on? USB 2 transfers at 480 megahertz. Um, does anybody know what frequency handband is? Like 430. Uh, business band is even worse, like in the 460s. Yep. Uh, yeah. Like if you use any of the radios that have the TTY inside the radio, they actually pop up a warning in this radio config software of, for the love of God, don't transmit while you're trying to upload to the radio because it picks up right into the radio and feeds into it, and I have bricked a radio that way before. You um, can yeah. de-auth awesome. someone's dongle. You know, we're in dongle gate now. You can de-auth somebody's Ethernet connection with a handheld radio regularly. You can move a mouse, because what bus does the mouse sit on? U S. Come on. U S B. Oh we're on old. the... The USB bus is really vulnerable to RF attacks. Those that are Wi-Fi pen testers, how often do you do USB-based frequency RF attacks? I can move your mouse. I can make your computer do things it's not supposed to do literally by keying up a 5-watt handheld near you. Now, who's tried to sniff Wi-Fi on a USB 3 hub that is really, really cheap? Yeah. It leaks energy all over the place and completely ruins your signal. Like, 
those big, thick cables that nobody likes, those are the good ones for a reason. They're good. Uh, headphones are up here. Why? A, because I don't want to listen to other people talk while I'm trying to work. When you get on a train, headphones, the, you know, the really big ones are, are like the universal don't talk to me signal. But headphones are important if you're trying to listen to RF signals. So as you're listening to these RF signals, you're going to hear voices, you're going to get video, you're going to get things that you want to hear. Um, I had an assessment that we were on in the middle of Trafalgar Square in England. Well, if you've ever been there, there's a few other embassies around there. They will be named unnamed. Unnamed at this point? Unnamed. We were doing an assessment. We found some stuff. And the next thing I know, we're hearing chatter. And I didn't recognize the language, so I called in somebody that might. And he's like, oh, that's not good. It's like, OK. So we, you know, as an intelligent assessor does, we go to the ground, took a surface that's running Linux, because it looks like I'm walking around as a tourist with a tablet, a bunch of shit in my backpack. Next thing I know, I've got a group of people with earwicks and flags on their chest following me and the guy that I'm working with because they realized that we intercepted their communications and we were down on the road trying to triangulate where they were. Well, this isn't an abnormal situation if you're doing red teaming in, in America or other countries. It really doesn't matter where you are. That happening allowed me to realize that, you know, people see what you're doing, your OPSEC matters. Radios have to be down when you're doing this stuff because they can fingerprint me digitally. So as we're going through, the headphones were what allowed me to at least look semi-touristy and get the work done that I needed to get done. It uh, also helps in personal relationships. My wife refers to my radio as Mr. Crackly, and I am uh, only allowed to use it if I have my earbuds in. Who has a scanner? You ever listen to a scanner? They're not, not quiet. In fact, they're very loud, and they're very, usually not well-tuned because you're getting a signal from like 60 miles away. Um, the key to all this is know what your gear does, know what your signatures look like, and know what other people can see of you as you're walking around. And then antennas assorted. Um, how many antennas are you carrying right now? Me? Yeah. Um, About 200. I mean, just, okay. Just in my pocket? Yeah, I was going to say, um, I've got two in my pocket I mean, right now. here, like... I mean, 45 or 50. antennas matter, and yeah. frequency matters. And some of the talks you've heard today talk to the frequencies that go on and how they work. A 2.4 gigahertz antenna on a, on a 433 megahertz tra uh, transmitter or transceiver isn't going to give you a whole lot of, of anything good. It's going to give you a lot of dirty signal. Understanding what you're doing with antennas is super important. So these are two tools that we live in quite a bit in the Wi-Fi world. One on the left has pretty colors. The one on the right has more pretty colors. Which one are you presenting to a CEO? I hope neither, and I hope you're writing up an assessment of actually what they say and not what that's showing. Um, but Aerodump and Kismet are pretty much the de facto. Yes. What, Chris? <laughs> He's saying hi. Are you just saying hi? Hi, Chris. Can you say hi to everybody, Chris? If, you're gonna, if you don't have enough to share, don't give anything out. OK. <laughs> He does have enough to share. Everybody go share with Chris. <laughs> Start with hugs. He's a very nice guy. He loves hugs. Bear looking for a twink in the back. If everybody's getting up to give him a hug, sit back down. <laughs> or don't. He might punch you. <laughs> or hug you. I'm not sure. So Kismet and AeroDump are the two kind of go-to tools. AeroDump for Wi-Fi specific. Kismet, as you see, if you come over and look at some of the work we're doing, Kismet gives you a lot more information. It gives it to you in a much better form. And then, uh, Mike, if you could just give us packet captures back and not make us script it, that would be great. Um, it totally doesn't always crash on the PCAP-NG output. Um, but these are two really good tools to use these capabilities we're talking about. So to get to where you're going, you're going to have to pack it out some way. So you can pack it covert, the, the Osprey bag on the right. You can be totally, I'm a soft guy, I've got my Oakleys, I've got my Levi's, I've got my Hard Rock Cafe shirt on, and wear your M M11 backpack. You need a Pelican, you need something to travel with. Having the ability to get your gear from one place to another is super important. That MRAP app actually happens to be a war driving vehicle. Um, ha ha! See, see where I went with that? That was, that was clever. That was fun. So, 
again, if you're putting stuff in your car, the reason that Kismet box was built is I wanted the ability to throw something in the car, plug it in and have it run, as opposed to plugging a hub in, plugging things in, getting everything set up, setting up a network and all that other bullshit. So having the ability to just throw it into the vehicle you're in is very helpful. You've got to get your shit from one place to another. One of these will probably help. I don't have a rental car here because frankly rental cars tend to suck, just ask Woody. Um, they've got a lot of flaws to them and your data goes to pretty much everybody. Who has an Android phone here? You can raise your hands proudly on that. Even though iPhones are a better phone, Androids are better devices. These are devices that you can, are tools that you can use on Android. We've kind of talked through this over the years as to what works, what doesn't. Um, this would be something I would take a picture of um, or, you know, get the video later. But these particular tools make your Android device a relatively covert device to do things with. As long as you have the right OTG cable. The Nexus 5Xs are decent devices, but they only work with like three OTG cables which means that they kind of suck when you're trying to do work. Um, understanding how your, how your tools work. Um, if you're at DEF CON, we used to be really concerned over those things that killed Steve Irwin. I'll let you Google that one. But Open Signal and LTE Discovery do an amazing job of telling you when cell towers move. Why would it be a problem when cell towers move? Discuss amongst yourselves. Um, Having the ability to see them is very helpful and OpenSignal and LTE Discovery do a really good job for that. Um, anything else you want to talk about on there? No, but that uh, guy has a question. Yes, question. Hi. No. Yeah. Um, Apple very specifically. Wait, real quick, the question was, are there ways without jailbreaking your iDevice, I'll leave it at iDevice instead of phone, um, to detect moving signals over LTE, GSM, or 4G or 5G? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to uncharacteristically say something kind of pro Apple here. They are really, really, really bad to the app developers by preserving the user's privacy. They do things like not allowing you to read the MAC address of the device and not allowing you to read the information of the device basically at all. Whereas Android makes all of their money from app developers who are basically stealing all of your private information. So they give you everything. If you're an app on Android, you can access the GPS, you can access what Wi Fi is nearby, you can get all the MAC addresses of everything anywhere near you. And things like NRF Connect do exactly that to track the local Bluetooth devices and show them to you. But Apple locks all of that down, doesn't even make it optionally available to protect you from those companies being evil with your data. Um, Apple may in fact be secure in that way. Android may in fact be useful in that way. And unfortunately your choices are one or the other. Um, so, you know, whatever. Personally I carry two phones. I carry a device and I carry a phone. I like Apple's as phones. I like Android's as devices both of which fit in my pockets and they both work really well, but you got to figure out what it is that you're trying to do when you're doing it. Any questions about those tools? Excuse me? Which I use... Android phone do you recommend is the question. I use a, uh, the, yeah, I use a Note because they're bigger screens and if I'm using it as a device I want to be able to see a little bit bigger screen. Um, you use pixels, right? I, I use whatever Google is selling because they're the only ones that actually get security updates in a timely manner. And uh, as it turns out, that's very important to me personally. I know, right? Good. Do OTG cables work with every phone? Maybe. No, no definitely not. They do yeah. work with a lot of phones. And USB-C is a lot better about that. But you also have to realize that there's not like drivers in these phones or whatever you plug in. So for example, almost every Android phone, including like the Chromecast sticks, can take a USB Ethernet and will use that as their primary Ethernet, but only like two or three chipsets actually work. Right. It's the most common ones, so it feels like, oh yeah, like every one of them works, but I've got a stack of them that just don't work. So there's a very limited driver set. You're not going to plug a Wi-Fi card into your OTG cable and use it on stock Android. There are products like NetHunter and the Pony Express products 
that have completely customized the kernel, the operating system to give you those extra drivers that are not available on like stock Android. But you can get like, you can plug an RTL SDR into your phone and you can use RF Analyzer and that absolutely works because it's a nice user space driver and somebody ported the RTL libs to Android. So there, there is a lot of capabilities, but don't, don't think it's a Linux computer. It's not. All right, so the sweet spot of where most people do their work. Wi-Fi 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Who here, especially you people over there, only has 2.4 gigahertz stuff with them? It's okay. Yeah, it's, uh, okay, you don't have to admit it because we all know. The truth is, nobody only has 2.4 gigahertz stuff with them. Your phone, your laptop, everything that you're not using for hacking is dual band. All of the stuff that people are using for hacking, like the sweet de-authing wristband on one of our contestants over there, is 2.4 gigahertz only garbage. And the truth is, 5 gigahertz is very, very well utilized here at DEF CON because every schmuck with 50 cents is de-authing Wi-Fi right now, but all their stuff is 2.4 gigahertz only. It's shocking that people are actually going around and not sniffing 5 gigahertz, okay? This has been a big complaint of mine for years, especially with AC. AC is only five gigahertz. There wasn't any enhancement to 2.4 for AC. So all of these laptops for several years are predominantly using five gigahertz. Even the cheaper devices are now mostly dual band. And truthfully, if it's not dual band, stop buying it. It's garbage. It is the most overused spectrum we have in the world and it's it's overlapping with your microwave. Like, it's the worst spectrum on the planet. Stop using it. Five gigahertz is great. Oh my God. Hey, talk about Wi Fi testing for now. Talk about Wi Fi testing? Yeah. What, what kind of Wi Fi testing should we talk about? Oh boy. Um, so, Ted, you still here? Teddy? Ted, no last name? Ted. Ted, wave hi. Thanks. So Ted gave a talk earlier called, Are You Interested in Kismet? It was a great pun. But the truth is, Kismet has a wonderful API that gives you all of its information and allows you to kind of poke at it. So we used uh, Kismet, mostly him. I had the idea and begged for somebody else to write it for me. Um, he rewrote my Kismet shootout into a REST API call to the new Kismet, and it allows you to test competitively those cards against each other. And that is, again, one of my primary ways of testing Wi-Fi cards. In addition, testing things very fairly is almost impossible. Uh, I have a large baggie of really, really crappy antennas, not because I use crappy antennas, but because they're all exactly the same crappy antennas. Mostly, I use the uh, little zero DBI ones that come off of the Senna dongles because I have a bag of like 20 of them, and that allows me to test like 10 or 15 cards with exactly identical antennas at once to see what really is what. And so we spent a lot of time testing with things like that. Um, I just feel like this slide is inappropriate. I want, I want this one, it feels better. Talk about Wi-Fi. Uh, so yeah, testing with things like the new Kismet Shootout and testing with especially Air Replay NG. Air Replay NG is the primary tool that everyone uses to inject packets. It's also the best tested because people complain immediately if something doesn't work with Aircrack because it is kind of the gold standard. So the Aircrack guys get all of these bugs, they fix all of these bugs, and they generally have a nice working product. So if you test it with Kismet Shootout, and it looks like it receives more packets than most of your other cards, and you test it with Air Replay NG, and it looks like it reasonably high percentage of successful transmissions, that is a damn fine Wi-Fi card. Uh, if you run one of those tests and it doesn't work out for you, that sucks. Um, also run a lot of connected tests. I know it sounds weird because, you know, what does a hacker need to connect to a Wi-Fi network from? But the number one thing I used to see, which was the funniest thing on the planet, we were running a capture the flag and everybody had those 802.11 G only alpha cards that were so popular for so long. The 036 H's that everyone loved so much. The one watt alphas. Um, and they would buy these things and they would crack the web and it'd be two minutes later because the thing has great injection support and then they'd try to connect to the network and they couldn't do it because that card's firmware was so light. You could do basically anything you wanted with it. You could 
reject raw frames, you could capture raw frames, but man, if you try to connect to the Wi-Fi network, the thing sucked. You had to be within like six inches of the access point for them to reliably connect. One watt, it was not. Successful at connecting, it was not. I love the Realtek ones for connecting, to be quite honest, because they actually have enough firmware on them to do the job correctly. So testing things when you're connecting is, is actually a big deal. You have any uh, Wi-Fi testing stuff you want to talk about? I talked about shootout, air replay, and just actually using it as a Wi-Fi card, which is oh, wow. a lot of Oh, that's crazy. Know, right? That is absolutely crazy. Yeah. No, I, I think it, the biggest thing you got to look at is what are you trying to do and when are you trying to do it? If you're trying to hit channels 1, 6, 11, and A band, it, you can do that with one radio. But you're going to miss handshakes. You're going to miss data. You're going to miss packets. Data loss on these radios added to the fact that it's channel hopping is going to give you a hard time. So again, testing the best you can to do what you're trying to do. Who's ever war driven? Ooh. Wiggles back in the back, usually. They, they left for the day. But Wiggles been here. Wiggles been doing this stuff for like 20, 17 years, 18 years, oh, something. God, forever. As long as like the IPAC and the Proxmark Gold existed. Wiggle's been capturing data all over the world. If you've war driven before, and, and or if you just want to guess, what's the optimal speed to drive while war driving? 90. With your rig, yes. What is the optimal speed? Yeah. Zero, park outside. Your GPS is going to suck. And you get like, you know, a couple. No, seriously, if you're war driving, if you're driving around trying to get access points, you want to be as efficient as possible, what's the speed you drive? How many Wi-Fi cards do I have? What's the speed? Five. Okay, that's a thing. Anyone else? Can you drive ten on most roads? Can you drive five on most roads? What? Five minutes over the speed limit. <laughs> so the, 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 what you read if you Google it, and I've done this before, is 35 miles per hour is the optimal speed to war drive. How many channels are you getting in that 35 miles per hour as you're passing? If you don't test your equipment, Rick said 90. With some of the rigs he uses, he could drive 90 miles an hour. There's, what, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 14, plus uh, 37. 220 if you unlock the firmware. What's the, uh, yeah, there's what, 60 channels roughly right now? In the U.S., like 44. 44, okay. 44 channels. If you're driving 35 miles an hour down the road, this is not the algebra train question. If you're driving 35 miles per hour down the road and you have 44 channels to hit, and you don't know how many channels you're going to hit as you're driving, did you get all the Wi-Fi? No, you didn't. But if you know that you can drive this fast with these 12 radios, 6 radios, 5 radios, and they're locked on channels and not channel hopping, then you can come up with an optimal speed. So when you're trying to do the collection and you're trying to do your testing, do that testing. You keep this kind of theme coming back. Test your stuff before you go out. If you just want to collect data, I mean, Aardvark gave a talk in, on a panel, semi-sober. Well, he gave a talk for about 10 minutes and then he just started, you know, being Aardvark. Um, he runs around with like 15 Android devices. He drops them onto Ubers. He does all kinds of work to get things up to, go, to, to wiggle. And he does a good job of it because he's dispersed what he's trying to do. But if he was trying to drive around with Ellen, Jimmy, Johnny, Jen, Jen, and I don't know, whatever other names he's named his access points, he's not getting the same amount of data that he's trying to get. Um, yeah, does anybody here know how many Wi-Fi cards you can channel hop with in Linux at once? I found this one out. No one? Got any guesses? How many can you channel hop at once? Two? That's a guess. That's a good guess. She's got eight fingers up? I couldn't even tell. And, and one. Hi. One hey, card Abby. at a time can channel hop. You can only issue a command to one Wi-Fi card at a time in Linux. So if you have 30 of them, you have to queue. The queuing system is not even fair. It's just whoever takes the lock first wins. So when you put a bunch of stuff together and you say, well, you know, there's uh, 44 channels and I'm just going to channel hop at five a second and I'm going to put nine cards in there and I'll be great. Uh, except you can't actually do that. Uh, you end up with wonderful setups like my Kismet box where the load average is 12 because all of the cards are stuck in D state waiting to channel change one at a time. Um, it's a really interesting feature of Linux that we're currently working on fixing. Uh, well, by we, I mean Johannes Burke, who's actually a god and writes most of the Linux stuff, 
but he's been helping me through fixing this problem and I've been testing for him to actually allow you to channel hop with more than one card at a time because welcome to 2019, people have more than one Wi-Fi card now. So, so it's, it's, testing's important. So understanding how your stuff works matters a lot. And if you don't understand it, you can't use it properly, you shouldn't be getting paid to do what you're doing. And I am calling everyone out that's getting paid to do this type of work. If you don't know how, we don't normally give two hour talks. We can talk for like eight or 10 hours at a time, but we're never closing. Um, but we run the village so we can keep it open as long as we want. So you guys can ask as many questions as you feel free to ask. Um, with this testing though, understanding where, where your devices work and how they work is gonna be critical. The best way that I've found to do testing, and it's really, really stupid and it's really basic, get an access point, whether it's your phone, your device, your laptop, whatever it is, and go out to a soccer field or a football field or somewhere outside where that big yellow thing is in the sky that burns you, and set up that access point at like the zero yard line. For those that are you know, happy with sports ball, that's where the big lines are. Put that access point there and walk out 100 yards. And it's nice on a football field because it's already marked for you. And stand there and get a reading from your device and see what reading that is. Then move to 90, 80, 70. I don't think I have to go all the way down for you. Um, and write down what those ranges are. At that point, you know that at this distance on a perfect day, my radio works at this efficiency. And when you have that ability to have that knowledge, you can move forward with the way you're working because you know exactly what your devices are gonna do. Now, caveat that with, we're manipulating physics when we're dealing with wireless devices, whether they're RF of any sort, it's not gonna be perfect. But if you compare two or three devices to each other, you have the ability to say, my empirical data says, this device is better than this because of this. Understanding how that works is critical when you're doing your testing. If you're standing, please feel free to sit down. We've got lots of seats. Bluetooth. Some of you said you work with Bluetooth. Who has the ability to de-auth Bluetooth? Anyone? Because if you do, I want to talk to you. Bluetooth is a really, really cool capability within the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. Bluetooth, by design, frequency hops as it goes from, P, from connection to connection. As it frequency hops, in order to de-auth Bluetooth, you have to jam the 2.4 gigahertz frequency. Who's allowed to jam in any country in the world the entire 2.4 gigahertz frequency? Oh, no feds here. Okay, cool. Um, when you have that ability, the reason that they've stopped it, and the reason the FCC has gone really strong on it is 2.4 gigahertz is what also allows you to make cell phone calls over Wi-Fi. Who's ever seen, you know, do you want to call over Wi-Fi instead of using cellular? If you block 2.4 gigahertz and you block the ability to get across those signals, you can't call E911, which means you are doing a public safety disservice and therefore you're breaking rules. That being said, Bluetooth will de-auth, it will disconnect if you jam the entire 2.4 gigahertz frequency set. But it's smart enough to not do that. So a lot of the work that we do in Bluetooth has changed over the years. Yes? Yep. Yep, those black helicopters do not joke. They are 100% legit 100% of the time. Messing with this stuff is really bad. It's bad for reasons, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So what he said was, and I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit, but there was a guy in California that was taking uh, I-70, I-71, the 71, right? Is it the 71 we're in California? Um, and he was jamming Bluetooth because he was sick of people talking on their, f oh, GSM. He was jamming cell phones from working because he didn't want them to function while they were going, you know, going forward. Um, that being said, he got fined $30,000 and had jail time simply because he was jamming. The FCC eventually found him. They don't mess around. 
They don't, and they don't for a lot of reasons. And, you know, hey, hack the planet, you know, rock on. Some of this stuff is for our own good. I mean, it's, it's not all bad. Some of it really sucks. I mean, legally in this district within the United States because of Google, thank you, Google, we can't sniff Wi-Fi outside of a place where you have a rules of engagement, which, by the way, because this is on record, we've given a rule of engagement for our wireless capture the flag. Feel free, if it says WCTF in all caps, to beat the living poo out of it. But other than that, you're not supposed to do any sniffing within the state of, within the, what's it, the, Rick, is it the ninth district? Where are we? What district are we in in California? They, ninth, yeah. Within the ninth district, not, you know, not a, um, to, uh, not to say that you can't do it with, with rules, but by legal, you are not allowed to sniff traffic within, within that space because Google did all their Google driving and everything else, yeah. How would you catch somebody driving down the highway with a jammer? We're gonna move on to SDR for a second, which is later in this, to jam. In order to do broad spectrum jamming, you have to spread, send, let him run, Piero, it's okay. That's not Piero. Wow, he looks like Piero. In order to do broad spectrum jamming or wideband jamming, you have to send out a ton of energy. The emission of that energy is a very specific um, um, uh, there's a word I'm trying to come up with signature thank you is a very specific signature that is very very easy to find um, I've done some FCC fox hunting before where we go out and look for jammers uh, two years ago we actually put out a um, a request to our wireless people over radio and a bunch of other communications there was a group that was jamming out the ham radio devices that Telefreak was trying to run, and we went out into the hotels and found the jammers, but we put out enough information that they got scared that we were looking for them that they stopped. Finding jammers is really, really easy. Um, we're gonna get into SDR in a second. Thank you, to those of you that have won, walked through this marathon with us. That type of testing is really important because you have to find those rogue signals that are giving you a problem, and you have to find those devices that are talking too loud, and that's how you start to look for them. Yeah, we actually got a report of somebody jamming our ham radio repeater uh, just yesterday, and uh, we spent a little bit of time looking for the jammer, and it turns out that my $40 amplifier had uh, shorted itself and really, really needed a reboot. Yep. Uh, we were jamming ourselves very effectively. Only five watts. Hack yourself! Did you know that five watts reaches the flamingo clearly? I didn't. But uh, turns out it does, and the amp's heatsink works great. Yes. Yeah, it was really hot. <laughs> yeah, uh, question in the back. All right. So the, the question uh, is, I'll, what about jammers? Yeah, what is what? Is, what do we do about jammers for like a home alarm system or whatnot? And the truth is, if it's wireless, it's not a it's not an alarm system. It's not a security system. So if your cameras are wireless, especially if they're Wi-Fi. If your door sensors are wireless, if your only way to get out is cellular, it's not a security system. So I'm not giving up my personal protection, but to be fair, I use one of those devices, and they will be remain nameless. The one I chose has Zigbee, Wi-Fi, and hardwired Ethernet. If you're that good, you're throwing something through my window or cutting the glass and coming in, and then you've got to deal with my dog and guns and a whole lot of other things. But your personal protection and how you deal with that, you have to understand what those risks are, and you have to be comfortable with them. So if you don't want to get jammed in 2.4, and then you jump 2.4 and 9 gigahertz, cool. Then you've got something that's hard-lined in over, over coax, and then you've got Cat5 or Cat6 or whatever it is. You can't do a lot more. I mean, to be fair, there's, there's probably like microwave or satellite technology you could use, but if you've got a triple backup on three different frequencies or four different frequencies, I don't know how much better you can do. Yeah, the truth is if I cut your phone line and jam cellular, I, your alarm system's not going to alert nobody. Um, but yeah, there, there's always a risk. You have to decide what the risk is. But, but truthfully, the, 
the really garbage uh, door sensors are really, really garbage. Hardtail 433 decodes a few of them. It's pretty yeah. funny. You know, watch your neighbor's doorbell get rang or their doors open and close or their windows open and close. Um, at one of the companies I formerly worked for, they told me everything was wired. Um, they were wrong. So I wrote a little script that replays door open, door closed, door open, door closed, just in a loop. And it turns out you can't... But you're an asshole. Like I am. But it turns out you can't arm the security system like that. But it does blink like it's party mode. So it was fun for one of us. So within Bluetooth, there's a couple different things. You can have your internal Bluetooth radio. If you've got a laptop, this is what it looks like. It's the first one on the left. We look at currently, the one that we're using is the Senna UD100. It does a really good job for decent distance Bluetooth. And then we've got an Ubertooth 1. Ubertooth 1 is not a Bluetooth radio at all. It's a 2.4 gigahertz spectrum analyzer, but it does an amazing job decoding Bluetooth data. So when you start to pair these together and use specific tools that give you the ability to change these, you get good data. Now that being said, that first radio, who, who takes the radio out of their laptop as soon as they buy it and replaces it with something else that they buy online because they've researched them? Man, those new Intels, and the answer is not which model, it's literally all of them. Like, you can buy new Intel Wi-Fi chips for like 30 bucks usually on Amazon or eBay, and you can get the latest wireless card that everybody wants to support, and they're really cheap. Yeah. Like, I remember like buying bucks. $200 Wi-Fi cards, and now I buy stacks of $30 Wi-Fi cards that are way better. Hey, janitor, make a hole. Okay. Hey, could you clear the door, sir? you, you got to keep the door clear for fire code. Thank you, janitor. For those that have not been to any con ever before, janitor <laughs> is usually the loudest voice in the room. So Unless the fact that I have 2,400 watts to speak into... Sorry. Yeah, you're a delicate flower and so is Quad. Delicate flower, know. yes, yes. Why so, don't the two of you talk to each other? I think he's in Paris right now. Just point and talk. So I'm going to jump over a couple slides. We can come back to Bluetooth, but is Iceman still here? Is Iceman still here? No. He was. No, he literally a second ago was here. Nope. Nope. Okay, we're not going to jump. I was going to jump over to RFID, but I think he walked out because we've been talking too long. That's fine. Let's talk about mouse jacking. So, mouse hey. Mouse jacking's funny as hell. Who knows about mouse jacking or logic attacking? Yep. No? Yes? Some? Maybe? Okay, we're going to give a little bit of teaching here, not a lot, because we are talking about testing. Mouse Jack, they even have a really cool logo. Thank you, Bastille. Cool logo. There is a device that you can buy called a Crazy PA Radio. The Crazy, crazy Radio P PA. Crazy Radio PA, whatever. If you Google it, you'll find it. Uh, the Crazy Radio has the ability to find and inject into Logitech, Dell, Microsoft, and Amazon wireless mouse and keyboards. If somebody can come up off the top of their head with another company that does wireless mice and keyboards, be happy to hear it. Anyone? It's pretty much every 2.4 gigahertz receiver. In, in they're there. encrypted receivers, which is nice because they're, they're safe. By the way, we gave this talk at B-Sides DC and Asaka was still running her wireless mouse and may or may not have had her laptop rebooted during a CTF while she's gabbing at the mouth over there and not paying any attention yet again. Hi, Osako. Yeah, wow. She's not, it's she's funny tough. she's right in front of us. She really is. Too. Anyway, we tell people this and they still don't listen. What I can tell you 100% is this attack allows key injection, code injection, redirection, manipulation, into devices that are running these mouse and keyboards. For 20 bucks, you can check to see if you're a problem or anybody you work with is a problem or anybody you're working for is a problem. Forget 20 bucks. Who here follows MAME82 on Twitters? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's, it's MAME82. And if you follow this guy, he's come out with the Logi Tacker attacks. He's been teasing about it for weeks and just really killing all of us. He found a way to extract the keys by plugging the receiver in. He found a way to inject keystrokes past the whitelisting feature of the clickers. So clickers normally can't have keys, and he found a way to bypass that and actually inject keys into the new clickers that have the protection. He found ways to force pair to the dongle, so even if you don't have the keys for something that they're actually using, you can add your own keys and use those. 
I mean, like, literally every way you could break it, dude found a way to break it. And then he released uh, what's called the Logitech unifying... Um, unifying dongle, dongle. Unifying stuff. And he's got another dongle of which he lists a number that he likes that have a, a, a newer chipset than the Crazy Radio PA. And those are as low as like $9 yeah, they're, on they're Alibaba. Cheap. So you just have to wait six weeks to play with them. I was really mad because mine showed up three hours after my flight to Las Vegas. Nice. But um, yeah, these things are really awesome. The attacks are really legitimate. We like this one because it is supported by Kismet, and it will find all of the vulnerable devices. The newer attacks do require the newer dongles to run some of the stuff. Not all of it. You can actually run some of the attacks with the old, the, the crazy radio. But this one works with Kismet, which means I can just walk around, find vulnerable devices, or you know, park in your parking lot and find vulnerable devices, and then go to town. So funny story. I was working with a client, which obviously is going to remain nameless. They had pretty decent security. They had triple authentication somehow. I don't know how they did triple, but triple authentication to the Amazon cloud. They were jumping through VMs. They weren't working off their main desktop. They were using VDI. If you have a buzzword that exists over at Black Hat, they were using it to get into the Amazon cloud. They were using GovCloud. Even though they weren't a government agency, they were able to get in. So literally as secure as they could possibly be. Well, except for the fact that they were using a Logitech mouse and keyboard to do all the work that they were doing. From the parking lot, and we measured because they really wanted to know in the op brief how far it was, it was 126 meters away from where the keyboard and mouse were sitting. The I was rated in, distance on the Logitech mouse and keyboard is 10 meters. I was injecting keystrokes into their development cycle into the Amazon cloud from the parking lot, well over standard. Wasn't it from three, like through three VMs? Yeah, it was, it was a ridiculous set of connections, all kinds of dual authentication. The, the basic, the bottom line here is whatever your mouse and keyboard have contacts with on your screen is where this will start injecting. So when I pulled back my reverse shell, my reverse shell was not within the rules of engagement, was not within the client site, was not even an IP address I recognized, so I stopped everything, called them up and said, hey, what's this? And they're like, um, um, that, that, that's our cloud instance on our secure side. Huh. So just wanted to let you know, if you look at the net stat on that box, you'll see this IP address, and they're like, yeah, what, what's that? I said, okay, watch your screen for a second. Click, 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 click. Oh, shit. <laughs> So this attack, even though it's a localized attack, is mitigatable. You can actually do a really good job of updating the firmware and making a whole bunch of changes. But this attack isn't just an RF attack. This is bordering and bound, going across boundaries that should not be crossed with RF. Questions? So. The guys at Simple Wi-Fi, Wireless World, and whatever else they're going to be going by this week, We're Raul, who's an amazing dude, created antennas a couple years ago that we really, really like. It's a 12 dB, dual polarized, four port antenna that's dual band. So it's 2.4 and 5 gigahertz dual polarized. Four inputs. I've never not been able to get onto a client site with that antenna. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, but it gives you a lot of distance, 12 dB, so it's, it's 12 dBi increase off of this little radio because it's 2.4. No, no, it's, it's uh, we call it the Ukrainian Easy Pass because that's pretty much what it looks like. It's just like, it's like this big and white. Uh, if you had one of those amplified log periodics with like, like a pistol grip, would that have been convenient? That might have been convenient. You know anybody that makes them? That, I, I don't know anyone who makes them, but yeah. I think Alex might. So. There's a lot of antennas you can use, but from that distance, I was able to hit it really clearly. Really cleanly. So, all right, software-defined radio. So we've talked about hardware-defined radios. Software-defined radios give you the ability to, if you can program it, you are that radio. So if I want to be a 133 megahertz radio, I'm a 133 megahertz radio. If I want to be a repeater, I'm going to be a repeater. If I want to be a GSM cell tower, I'm going to break a billion laws, but I can be a GSM cell repeater. Um, and there's all kinds of YouTube videos on, uh oh, what's he doing? Oh, okay. On Raspberry Pi with Blade RF becoming a cell repeater. 
Software defined radios are absolutely amazing and game changing. Years ago, there was a discussion that we had in Wireless Village that we talked about why Bluetooth was not economical to break into because to do the type of work we needed to do, it was way too expensive. Well, now we can break into anything with an RF signature that is within the oscillating power of that radio just by making some GNU radio blocks and making it do what we want it to do. So if you guys look up front, up on this screen that's been behind us the entire time, um, do you want to play with the knob or does it get oh, rid of Oh, yeah, our... I want to okay. play with the knob. So that is an Edis, I don't even know what because none of us can afford it except for people that are buying it with major... How much does that cost? How much does the Edis cost? To the muggles in the room, how much does the Edis radio that we're using hey, cost? How much does this thing cost? How much does this cost? Can I afford it? Ten okay. grand. So that ten thousand dollar software defined radio with He's a nice guy. Everybody clap for Nate for letting us borrow this. He even set it up to print our logo in the screen. It's awesome. That is pushing is it two hundred megahertz of bandwidth? What? Oh, it's only a hundred today? Oh, you cut it in half. Oh, Iceman, you came back. Thank you. We're almost there. So that is pushing across 100 megahertz of bandwidth simultaneously, allowing us to see everything going on in the space that that screen is showing us. If we wanted to program that radio to then inject into those streams using those protocols, we can do that. So this can be a Wi-Fi radio. This can be a Bluetooth radio, a Zigbee radio. This can be all kinds of stuff. Nate's going to play with his radio a little bit. You want to show us Wi-Fi? How about if you show us all of Wi-Fi? Oh, you did already. That's all of Wi-Fi. So remember when we were talking about jamming Bluetooth? Don't do it, but he could. Please don't do it. Um, but we have the ability to get all of that spectrum in one spot. Software-defined radios, even, uh, I'll be honest, 10,000 is cheap for what this is capable of doing, give us the ability to manipulate RF in a way that we've never been able to in the past. Yeah, I really can't stress it enough that like most of these software-defined radios we love the answer is only what makes sense for what you're doing. Like I said earlier, we're using the tiny little cheap Wi-Fi dongles that don't go 25 feet because we only need them to go 20 feet, and that was the best thing for us, right? Edis owns the entire top end of the SDR market. There is not a competitor. There is not anything else you want to buy. They make all of the good stuff. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not you. You don't have to worry. You're not going to get in trouble for this. Edis makes all of the good shit. Okay, I'll make him feel better. So there are other companies out there that are spectrum analyzers that do a really good job, like in Ritsu and others, but they are not software-defined radios, and they do not do what this stuff does. There, is that good? And they go for like a hundred grand. Right. Edis doesn't go for. I'm sorry. What are we calling you now? They're, they're a national Edis, instruments. Edis. Brand. A <laughs> Does that sound familiar to anyone? Yeah, that anyway. sounds right. So, point right. is, if you have never done software-defined radio stuff, go over to the vendor area, buy a twelve-dollar RTL SDR. So that radio in the middle, the one that says Next Smart, I think. N E. That's no elect. S D R. SMA, that's the connector. RT, that's the Realtek chipset. They made a pun. They did. They're punny. That yeah. goes for like 15, 20 bucks. It does not transmit. It receives only. It receives from, if I remember correctly, 300 to 1.1? No, I think it's like 50 to 1.7. 50 to 1.7. Okay. And they also have new ones. But the point is, is I have like 15 of them. Because they are cheap and they are great, and you can always find an excuse to buy one more. And if I you only have the one Edis board. <laughs> if you burn it up, it's not a big deal. You can test no. things. You can receive things. Most of what we're talking about that's not 2.4 or 5 gigahertz, you can see with this. You can see GSM. You can see ADSB. You can see airplanes flying in the air. You can see seafaring objects going out into the water. You can decode the P25 radios the goons are using right now. Yes, you can. We tried to help them, too. Anyway, moving on to the left is the Edis B205. That is another software-defined radio that we use very heavily. It's about that big, if you can see that. Um, very small, easy portable, extremely powerful, great fidelity. But again, I don't know, what are they, seven, eight hundred dollars set more? Yeah, no, he's, he's eight. One more time with real, real fingers. Oh, nine, eight, two, really, two fours? 
Here, let me give you I, three. I think three. that was that was $11. He said it's $11. They're $11. Buy them dollar. all now. I saw two so, fingers. That's what I saw. So they're like 800 bucks. <laughs> Coming down from there, you've got the new on Blade RF, my Blade RF Micro. Does an amazing job for about five or 600 bucks. It does dual band, it does transmit and receive, it has transceive capabilities. It's another good radio. Below that's the Hack RF. It's about what, 200 bucks, 300 Hack bucks? Hack RFs now? are a little less than 300 bucks, and they have our favorite add on on the planet, which is the Porta Pack. It's a software defined radio with basically a Game Boy on it, and you can decode all kinds of things, you can send all kinds of things. It's just a really, really useful thing. Truthfully, it is one of the lower end of the software-defined radios. Yeah. It's one of the older models of software-defined radios. But the usefulness of, a, of an add-on like the Portapack is absolutely groundbreakingly amazing still. And of all of these, I mean, Nuon and, Bla and, and Great Scott Gadgets do an amazing job working with the open source community. Thank God we know the guys that we know at Edis because they work amazing with the open source community too. They happen to all be standing over there. Um, but if they're in a green shirt, say hi to them. Um, hi, guys. Um, you've got to find something that's not only supportive, but also easy to use and has the drivers that you want to work with. So depending on your need, all three of those might be good. Some of the work we do, we have no problem using yardsticks and other you know, devices that work for specific frequencies. If you're trying to scan this much data, then you're looking at a much different, much different form factor, much different, much different product. Um, I'm going to jump over the next one real quick because I really want to talk about these, and we're going to talk about some RFID stuff. Ooh, here you go. Who, you can talk. Who has a badge at work, don't raise your hand if you don't feel like it, that lets you into the building you're going into? It's pretty common, right? Most of them have these three weird letters on them, H, then I, then D. So HID has some very strict rules on what we can talk about out loud versus what we can't talk about out loud. So we'll be happy to talk to you about things that can be done. But there's a really cool tool called a Proxmark 3. There's a branch of development called the Iceman branch, which has been just completely abominated and, and, and gotten rid of. And now there's an Iceman RRG, correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. RRG well, Iceman, yep. guys, this is Iceman. Say hi, Iceman. Hi. So we figured we would bring up our Swedish friend to help us with this talk because when it comes to dealing with RFID stuff, this is the guy that's writing the software that you, you hate right now. Um, For so sure. For sure. What, what are some thoughts you have on product testing, software test? I'm doing a panel of one. This is really fun. Wow. Product testing and product development when it comes to RFID as well as access controller. Oh. Wow, you weren't prepared I, I, for that one, were you? No, uh, no, I wasn't ready for that one at all. Um, what I think about that would say that people who are doing that, those companies, are doing it quite well, but they do not have a hacker mindset, so don't, they don't see it in a cloner's way of wanting to do it. So they would like to say that, oh, we have a safe cryptology, and they build up the readers and source for it, and then they will have... Um, someone to um, try to hack with crypto and oh no we use AES, we use triple this and that's safe and they all feel good about it and then comes little people around who goes like oh yeah I put your reader in acetone and I melted out the PCB and I extracted the firmware from your pick and then we decompile that and we analyze that and we found all your key generation algorithms and then we took that ideas and implemented it in the Proxmox source code, and boom goes your uh, cards. They don't think like that. And that's what I think about that. Yeah. So the Proxmark is pretty much, if you're doing this professionally, the de facto standard device that you're going to buy to start doing this testing. It handles most devices pretty well. Yep. It does receive and transmit pretty well. Yep. It's got a really cool new sexy super, which I still need one, Bluetooth add-on with a battery that allows us to go in your pocket and pick up stuff in an elevator. Um, and being realistic, what, from three, three to five inches? Oh, yeah. Well, you were an you imperial system. We got that. <laughs> uh, I'm what's sorry. A, what's 17 to 20 centimeters. Oh, oh no. Now, let's see. With a large antenna, you would go 14 centimeters. 14? Yeah. Okay. 
So I think um, I was within that superset. Yeah, that was a superset. Okay. Yeah, you have better antennas, I guess. Um, but, um, that's not the biggest issue. It's because if you see it as a part of things, if you other people who do doing RFID hacking used to combine things. So hardware hackers combine things with other hardware and make something even more uh, worse uh, or more effective. So they take like one of his HID readers you see there and they put a prox marking behind of it. So all of a sudden we're reading, because this company who does these products does a really good well of making a coupling and antenna design. So we have really long reading range because that's in the natural habitat of their systems should do. But if a weaponized is well, prox marking the behind of it, you do that, and you give a possibility of a prox mark even further, so which that, makes it kind of nasty. So that HID reader isn't the one you're used to seeing. It's about this size, and it's what you typically see when you're going through like a parking garage or like an easy pass or something like that. It's a big energizing unit. And if you ever open one of those up, there's like, I don't even, I, I've never actually measured it, but I'm thinking like 40 feet of copper wrapped yeah. around that thing with a decent yeah. power supply yeah. that enables that, that RFID card to get um, energized and hand out its weakened data, which is its ones and zeros that make it all work, um, which is a different talk that's gonna happen tomorrow by Babic, uh, talking about how that weakened data actually gets translated. But when you take something like the Prox or the ESP keys or something behind that big reader, again, we're getting into antennas now. If you're testing your equipment, if I only need to be this far from zero, a minimum on the head, that's fine. But if I need to be from me to Iceman, I need something that's gonna give me that distance. The tool itself might do the hardware or the work you need, but it may not have that reach that you need. So again, when you're getting into testing, you need to verify your distances, and if you're doing a pen test or you're trying to steal credentials, or if you're just a really bad guy and you're here to learn how to break into buildings, if you can get onto an elevator and get all the credentials in the elevator, versus walking into the elevator, and I've done this, unfortunately, and walk up to each person, Shame oh, excuse me, oh, oh, excuse me, oh, oh, sorry, let me stand over, no, I must stand over here. Okay, now I've hit everybody, but I look like an absolute fool, and it makes you look like, you know, you start to become a little more obvious, versus sitting there with that big reader inside of a backpack or a side satchel, which is the typical Tiger Team way of doing it with the satchel. Um, to get that data. European carry-all, not a perk. Isn't it a fanny a pack? Parisian style. It's a fanny pack. C'est très bien, ma It's very beautiful. Hey, Babic. Come here. So, the other person that we were going to bring up on stage for RFID, and I think they went to dinner because, you know, they've been working like 600 hours straight and all this. <laughs> so, the I'm other... Here, bro. Come on. The other night... On. Give him a round of lords. So I'm, I'm going to be honest about this, and I said this the other night, and I'll repeat it again. When it comes to RFID work, the world would end if this stage collapsed right now. Um, you've well, that got half of it collapsed. Right, right, that half. <laughs> just, just from here. Yeah. <laughs> you've got the developer of the tool that almost everybody uses, and one of the best uh, operators and instructors in the business on RFID. When you put those two together. This is why we do testing, because we're trying to beat, as the good guy, them from breaking into our shit. If we're the bad guy or being the adversary or putting on the hat of being the adversary, we're using, standing on their shoulders to do the shit that we're trying to do. Can I, can I add on? Actually? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, I brought you on stage for a reason. Yeah, so spoiler, I, I, I don't do testing for, for the... I, I have a philosophy thing that I rant on sometimes, but I'm going to keep it really short. Go ahead and rant. So, it's okay. This is a two-hour so, so talk. Con, They've got time. In my opinion, <laughs> DEF CON is not a security conference. This is a hacker conference. We yeah. hack because it's fucking fun and it's fucking cool. Like, if, it, if we can do it in a way that doesn't harm and creates good, then that's really wonderful. But I don't do it for that. I do it for the hack, right? That's, that's, that's why I really enjoy it. So uh, I do it because because for the sake of the hack, for the love of the hack, if I can do it in a way that benefits security in a positive way, then that's really wonderful. But, but if I found years ago that if I focused, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little white lie that we came up with. That's okay, this is the fifth soapbox of the night, so this is awesome. It's a little white lie that we came up with uh, to, make, to make it easier to talk to other people who don't get us. Like, oh my God, why do you do that stuff? Like, why are you on computers? Why are you picking locks? 
And just to get them to shut up, you're like, oh, it's, it's for security. We find security problems, and that's why I do it. No, you do it because it's fun. Like, they don't get it. They don't get it, but you do it You do it because it's fun, right? So that's, that, that, that's, that's it. But, so I, I wasn't going to speak for you, but that's pretty much what we've been saying all night. I, I enjoy it because it's fun. <laughs> I enjoy teaching. I, I enjoy the process of learning that, like, that moment where like things begin to click in your brain is like really, really addictive. So I like to inspire that and create that as much as possible for other people. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we've trained for so many years is because I like doing that. And if I can get paid to do it, then like, yay, right? Um, but yeah, that, that's it. I just want so, so when it comes to... I don't and, do this for security. Security and I'll be, is a byproduct. And I'll, I'll I do be, it for the hack. So we'll get back to real then. So when you're breaking shit and you're using your, doing your testing... What process do you use, the same question I posed to Iceman, what process do you use to test that this is better than that, and I make this new hardware, and this is better than that? What am I testing? Breaking into a building, RFID testing. Okay, and so the question is, how do I know what type of platform is better? What is your process on testing? Oh, shit. I don't want to buy just because somebody said to buy it. I'm going to buy three or four and test them and see which one works best. Oh, I, I look for, I, I look for um, little, little hallmarks of like how something might be designed, right? Like, for example, if I'm, if I'm comparing, uh, if I'm looking for a box to put stuff in, right? I'm like, man, I need something to carry things around. I need to buy a box. How do I know? I don't know a lot about boxes. How do I know if one's better than another? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start, I'm going to grab a box and I'm going to start looking at it. I'm going to be like, oh, interesting. How did they, how did they attach the sides together? Oh, look, they used adhesive. Well, they probably did it this way because it's a little bit cheaper. And this looks kind of sloppy. So, like, they made a box, but they don't care about boxes, right? So now I haven't, I, I don't know everything that went into it, but I have an idea of the design intent, right? But I might look at something else and I go, like, Oh man, look at this. This edge is rounded and they they like did this thing over here that's so interesting. Like look at all the extra work they went through on stuff that doesn't matter to anyone else. That tells me that this is a passionate design and engineering team and there was a lot more thought behind it. And I apply that same basic idea. I don't know what he's looking at. It's okay. Oh, I, I apply that same basic idea to uh, evaluating things for security. So I I don't have to understand how everything is designed. I pick the things that I do understand and that I can compare to other things and I go, okay, how well did you do this thing? And, and, and that, while it's not 100%, there is, there is generally a correlation. People who care about one part a lot tend to care about all the other parts as well because you don't make something beautiful and then put it inside something ugly. Like You, you want the whole thing to be really holistic. And, and work well together. I don't know if that's a good answer. No, no, that's the great. Best that's great. That I can explain. Because frankly, a lot of us buy a lot of stuff because people say, "Hey, go buy this." But if you don't have a methodology or a process, whether it's good or bad, it's your process to test what it is you're trying to fix or test what it is you're trying to break. You're just throwing shit at the wall until it sticks. I would love it if this industry started to actually take on the corporate mindset of just this, just this, I promise, I'm not gonna say corporate mindset, but of having a way of doing things that repeats so that you know that you're not wasting your time when you're doing your research. Oh, this radio sucks. Oh, wait a minute, I'm not using the right driver, the right kernel, or the right, the right tool, versus, oh shit, this works really well because I'm doing what I need to do. I, I, I'm gonna give you a for instance. Go ahead. For instance, I was looking at recently. Cookies? A, a physical token management device, commonly referred to as a key box. I was about to say, can yes. you be a little more English? Yes, yeah. So I, mean, I was, understand Iceman. I was, man, I was not... looking at a key box, and I'm like, okay, how do they set this up? Like, how do I know how much thought and effort went into the overall like architecture behind everything, all the guts inside? And I start looking at the instructions. And it, like within the first three pages, it's talking about how uh, you need to know how to use Telnet because everything is configured using Telnet. And so that, for me, was like kind of a red flag because like Telnet as a basis for configuring a security device, is that, 
is that a good best, best practice? Like, is that what you start with? Like, uh, uh, no. Thank right? you, Russ. So the fact that, in that even, even before I looked at anything else, the fact that they started with that was a red flag to me. I knew that immediately my, my level of trust for that product has, has gone down, right? I was doing an evaluation for something completely different uh, at another project. There was some, um, there was a physical locking device that had an electronic element to it, and they were talking about how wonderful and secure it was. They were really, really proud of it, um, and how it uh, revoked credentials, and how if someone lost the fob, then it would die after a certain amount of time. And then we started looking at the communication between this very special fob and some, you know, the thing that it talked to. And I have to be vague, unfortunately. I apologize. Um, and immediately it was, it was unencrypted serial with no, with no replay protection. You sound very security minded right now and, and not hacker minded. How would you break that? How do you what? break it? How would you break into that? Let's break into that device that you saw that you thought was really cool. Which which device? I don't know. The one with serial and unencrypted, unencrypted reads and what would you do to break that? Because this is all part of our testing as a security hacker. Oh I, Wow, we're now security I hackers. Would, I would start I just made that up. I would start <laughs> I would start recording things and playing them back and see what happens. <laughs> that's that's it. You just start you start trying things. Most of the stuff that I do is just seeing what sticks. It's the mm -hmm. same stuff that you guys do. There's there's no special sauce. I, I can't stress that enough. Like the whole lot of us are up here and we're clearly a bunch of incompetent jackasses. Yet for some reason people look up to us and the reason is is because we decided we don't know what to do. I'm just gonna start trying shit. And that's literally the entire thing about being a hacker. You can't get distracted by the fact that you have no clue what you're doing. You just need to start grabbing data that you can read and replaying it to see what happens. I didn't hack a security system at my office. I replayed the packets that I captured in the air and made a light blink. I am a monkey. I am a very easily entertained monkey, and that was fun. It happened to break the security system, but the, I did it for the blinking light, and that's what's important. You got to just do it. Just jump in and have fun and learn. Yeah, I wanted to just yeah, click in, you know. <laughs> wow, you got a, you got a My soapbox is the best soapbox. <laughs> well, well I, I come from a land of Ikea, so, you know, when they're assembling things, it's like, yeah, Everything it's one page. 65 pages and some little pieces of wood. And, and then a picture of saying you're missing or something. Uh, but, but it comes down to hacking things and the mindset of solving bugs or finding a bug is, I can just mention as a, a quick anecdote that, uh, but, do you know about the My Fair Dark Side attack? Do you know that one where, where you find the key for the um, My Fair Classic cards? Yeah. It's called Dark Side? Okay, whatever. No, if you know the Dark Side attack. The dark side attack. Does yeah. anybody know the dark side attack? I will be the interpreter. Yep, let's try another dish. Use your British accent. When, when most people talk about cracking the MyFair key, they're actually referring to the dark side attack. It refers to a very specific type of brute forcing. It was the original oldest attack. It was kind of a big fucking deal when it came out about 10 years ago. We have RFID. There is a box of cookies between them, too. They come to the dark side, we have cookies. Yes, we do. <laughs> And yes, uh, and, and the thing is, like uh, on the box market, um, it triggered. You could run, you could run an attack. It's in two parts. So you have a nouns, nouns collecting part on the device, and then you have an uh, offline brute force attack on the client. And somewhere, sometimes there was a problem on the device when you're trying to collect the right nouns and trigger the NAC bug, and it reset the device. And you trigger the, the VTF, the watchdog trigger, and it goes like. <coughs> All the time, so people were running attack and like, <coughs> and people going fuck. <laughs> so and like, I can't hack that key. I can't crack it. You know, I, I can't run my scripts. Whatever. And so, um, so we've uh, hit just about every device type that we're talking about, and we finished each one with, what questions do you guys have? If you have specific questions about this, and I'm cutting it because I'm a little bit worried about your guys' time. I really don't care that much because we can keep this place open all night. Um, but what questions do you have about RFID hacking and testing that basically the heads of state can answer for you? 
The question is, how easy is it to replicate RFID? Very easy. <laughs> <laughs> that is an incomplete answer. <laughs> it, uh, it, it, homework and stuff. So, so, so RFID really just refers to a couple of things. It refers to uh, the idea of using a very specific physical kind of token that traditionally uses uh, coils for communication as a means of identification. That's it, right? But there is a billion and one ways that you can create such a platform. So the, se that the second part of that answer is it depends on what type of RFID you're talking about and how that system was, was designed. Uh, the most popular one in the world, which is currently referred to as HID Prox, um, that is extremely easy because of the tools that exist today. Um, but is it one swipe for accessing doors? Right. Yeah, you're 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 asking me about credentials that you use to get through a door, right? But there's many different kinds of those credentials, is what I'm talking about. So so it is. I, I can understand why, how easy is it to clone RFID sounds like a very simple question. Um, and on, on its face, it is. But it doesn't, it doesn't cover all the different possibilities. If you were to ask me, how easy is it to clone a prox card, I would say, very, very easy. But if you were to ask me, how easy is it to clone a Desfire Evolution 2 credential, I would say, uh, I don't know of any publicly known defeat. <laughs> If you have a method for doing so, let me know because I have some people who will pay you lots of lots of dollars to learn that method. So right? you haven't you haven't heard about the attack against them yet, have you? It's called a sledgehammer on the window. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's another thing of this major RFID brands people know about HID or MyFair, it's the two largest. Uh, but we have a list on the forum. I think it's an Excel sheet of. Um, all the brands and different kinds of tags that's out there in RFID, and that list is about 4,000 items. So we cover about 20 to 30 of them in the Proxmark source code yeah. and the client, but there's a lot of different systems out there. And many of them haven't been researched. Many of them have not, not anyone has been looking into it. That's why the future of SDR is whether it's ultra high frequency cards and tags, because there's no really genuine, interesting research going on onto it, because there's no tool for it. And that's something to look forward to. This, the future of hacking is people like you listening to this and go like, oh yeah, so nobody did this yet? Interesting. Another question from over here. Was there one more question? One we're gonna take question. one more RFID, and no. then we're gonna move on. All right. And I'm only moving on because I know the Encore guys are like, I think they're falling asleep because they've been here longer than they should be. Yeah, go ahead. So, the, repeat the question. The, the, the question was, if I want to learn more about RFID when I go home, what's a, what's a good place to start? Uh, I'll tell you where I started. I don't know if it's the best place. It's a place. Uh, I started at the Proxmark forums. Me too. Um, like many uh, hacker forums, the signal to noise ratio is less than ideal. But if you are willing to put in the hours and the time, the information is there. Your two best friends are the forums and eBay. So if you're like, cool, I don't know what that post is talking about, this, uh, this this prox or in dollar reader, I've never seen that. How I, it looks easy. I wonder if it's easy. You know how you can do it without screwing with a real building. You go on eBay, you type in in dollar, and you start buying some stuff. And it'll take some time and a few more dollars, but you will get there. That's how most of us started. Uh, and it will take a little bit of a longer time, but that's that's your best shot. Hey, real quick, let me uh, jump in here. At this point, we're going to cut the recording. But because we run the village, we can keep it open as late as we want, and we'll just ask the goons to be really kind to us and not lock the doors yet. We're going to cut the recording. We're not leaving. We'll answer a billion questions. We're still going to talk about Hammond, Zigbee, and a couple other things. Uh, if you want to stay, awesome. If you want to go, feel free as well. 
Um, we're going to keep going, but we're going to cut the recording at this point. So if you need to, if you want to take notes, take better notes. Is that cool? All right. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, right, guys, you all have access control somewhere. Some of you have questions about something. Maybe they don't. They might not. Maybe they don't have the right tools. I have a question. Oh. If I was trying to set up an access control system that made sense for my organization, what would I do to test it against what could possibly happen? That's a good question. I know. <laughs> I came up with it. All you just made own. it up, did you? Yeah, you're right. You've done this before. Uh, let's see. The question was how I to just said the question. set up. We're okay. good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, you, you, you think, and I'll, and I'll start doing some, some talking, um, that How do you feel about this? Is this, is this good? They're Argentinian cookies. They're really good. They're really good. They're alfajores. They're really good. Uh, so the, the testing piece is a, is a difficult one. It's one that everyone uh, is curious about. Um, well, the first thing is how much do you understand about how that system is designed, right? So one of the things that we, we – it's, it's good, right? One of the things that we teach – is how every component works and how they're all connected. That's one of the things that I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. So this will be an easier question to answer. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, if you come to my talk at 4 p.m., I'm going to give you a very abridged, uh, but I feel somewhat comprehensive overview of how a modern access control system is designed and installed. But you're going to, the short answer is you're going to take a look at every link in the chain from the point that you have like your card you start with the card and say, okay, what kind of credential is that? What is the means of communication, authentication to the reader? Once the reader gets that information, what happens? Does the reader send it in the clear? Does it send it encrypted? Where does it go? Okay, it goes to this little door controller. That's what you see, the, the blinky green board in the middle of the, uh, the bright red readers for the CTF. That's called the door controller. You're going to learn about that tomorrow. The door controller is an embedded Linux computer. Usually that's really, really out of date because no one ever updates their firmware. So then my question is, how well is that door controller segmented from other parts of the network? Had they done something stupid like put it directly on the internet? Yes, that happens. Yes, you could Google for door controllers that are on the internet directly. That Shodan, my friend, Shodan. You can find door controllers online today that you can log into with admin admin. So, um, and then, you know, that door controller has to be connected to a database of users, right? Your users live in an SQL database of some kind. So then, how is that database secure? Has anyone changed the database credentials? Is that database on its own segment? Like, all of these things are really, really important. Uh, and it's a, more, it's, a more complex, it's a more complex issue uh, to look at. So, let me just roll back real quick. Because I was listening to Bavik's process. And, and Bavik has been doing this probably about as long as I have. He just described a process of how he would test that. What is different about testing door controller to connection to server to outbound connection to internet connection? Sounds a lot like network pen testing, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like web app pen testing. Sounds a lot like RF pen testing. Everything we do is a process. So if we're a bad guy and we want to break into shit, we're going to go through and say, huh, front door is locked. Let's look at the side door. Side door is locked. That sucks. Let's look at a window. Huh, window's open. Let's go through the window. We'll go in the window and we'll unlock the front door. Take that front door now. Oh, well, we got the car keys. We've got the garage keys. Now we've got all the keys. It's exactly the same. The media that we are going after, whether it's prox, Hey, does anybody here build prox marks? Uh, hey. Guys, okay, now if the room explodes, we're done. Um, but it's the exact same process and the exact same testing methodology. And I hate using big words that have a whole lot of syllables in a hacker con, and I don't have blue hair and most of it's starting to go away. But we do the same shit, whether it's RFID, ZigBee, Z-Wave, SDR, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or HAM, 
we're looking for that side window that's open that we can break into and come back through and attack. Did I say anything wrong? I, I kind of tuned out a little bit. Oh. <laughs> so did I. But, but it generally <laughs> sounded correct. I mean, oh, regardless of what you do, test your shit and make sure it works. If you don't test your shit and make sure it works, you're an amateur throwing data bits at a problem. If you're a professional, you may or may not have gotten paid to do this. I hope you're getting paid if you're a pro. But you're throwing shit at a block in sequential order, waiting for an answer to come back, and answering every one of those negative stimuluses with something that's meaningful to that network. The negative stimulus is what makes you better. Hey, Woody, come here. Don't let him describe his process. So, Woody has a different non-IT background. Am I wrong so far? That's enough description. Woody is a redneck hacker that does some shit really cool. And, and I'm, not, I'm not like pimping out talks. Woody's the dude that like took over all the Fords from like 2012 till now and is giving a talk tomorrow on how Fords get taken over and all the key codes get rolled and a whole bunch of other shit that he's going to discuss in depth. But Woody finds this shit by going, huh, that's different. Huh, that doesn't work that way. Let me try this. Oh, that failed. Shit. Am I wrong? Is that pretty close? Is that your process? Pretty much, and I just try to use simple tools that make it easy and fast, so if it doesn't work, I know, and then I move forward. So, I guess what we're all boiling down to is, you know, this was starting off as a gear talk, and we've got a bunch of other shit to cover if we want to, but every single one of us, whether it's classically trained CS, computer science, security people, versus people that literally came out of another completely other world, like a medic, and became a fucking published hacker to do shit that breaks every major device. It's like 10,000, 10 million devices right now. How many did you break? Uh, there, there's quite a few right now. It's, it's millions, right? Or, or lots of millions? Yeah. Or it's pretty big. We're not being recorded till anymore. Till Recording's done. till now, so yeah. It's so every Ford I can lock, unlock, denial of service to the key fob. Um, and then I can get in, plug in, and pull the door access code. So that being said, hacking is not hard. Hacking does require some sort of process that you can repeat, that you can make do what you want it to do. This was a gear talk. So just one thing I wanted to say with that. Go ahead, Woody. Uh, here we say it again is, because I wasn't formally or traditionally trained, I have friends that are really amazing who teach me how to do stuff, and when I find new stuff, I'll be like, hey, look what I found. They're like, why would you even run down that road? So one of the things is this. I found my first zero day because someone said, oh, yeah, that attack doesn't work against that kind of equipment. So I was like, well, I should probably figure out what not working looks like because I have no idea. And all of a sudden, it did work. And they were like, wow, it's not supposed to. So because I'm not formally trained, I try stuff that most guys would be like, I'm not going to waste my time looking at that. You'd be amazed how many people use that as a security platform to put those flaws in a system. But all of it comes back to doing something that's repeatable. I don't give a shit if you're the 500 pound dude in your mother's basement that never sees the light of day that types on computers. If anybody saw the, the tweets like two years ago, that was the big 400 joke. Pounds. 400 pounds? 400 pounds, 400 okay. Pound 400 pound hackers. We're all getting there eventually, but you know, hopefully we can cut it like half of that. To try to close it out with something gear related, just by way of example, yes. Is your, there your iWatch that's there, connected not to your phone? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe. No, we'll maybe check that tomorrow. Tell me if it we'll is. check that tomorrow. Um, is there is there a uh, device that someone has in their mind right now that they saw either on a building or online somewhere where they're like, huh? That looks really interesting. I wonder how hard it is to hack that. Okay, well, what are you thinking of in your head? I'm sorry? Okay. For emergencies? So okay. the emergency sirens that make everybody leave a building very quickly if, if they go okay. off. Yes? So? Yes? No? 
Yeah. Yes. So emergency sirens. All right. So that's actually a pretty cool example. They're serial. So my my yeah. So my <laughs> so my question is okay. I wonder how hard it would be to mess with that emergency siren. So the first thing I would do is I'd go I I, I would identify manufacturers who make emergency sirens and I would, would start reading product pages. Would and, you find maybe the physical rooms that they might hold? What's that? Would you find the room? Really? That's well, funny. Yeah. He's, would you find the rooms that those devices might be in, like something that says electrical data or facilities closet? Uh, yes, but I'm talking about as a, like, I just want to learn more, right? Are we learning more or are we hacking? Well, we're getting to the hacking. I'll let it, you go. Go ahead, Babbitt. They're, they're, they're connected, right? So I would, I would identify who makes them. Then I would say, okay, like how much information can I find about them? Do they post wiring diagrams? Do they post information about how this device commun communicates with other things? Are there any part numbers that I can look up and buy used on eBay? Can I buy a sample from the manufacturer? And then I would just start playing with it and trying to set it up the same way that a building would have it set up. And then I would start breaking it or messing with it. Um, and that's true for anything. You know, the same thing for RFID. When I started with RFID, I just started buying stuff and trying to get it set up the same way that a manufacturer would have it set up or a company would have it set up. And then I'd start looking for things that don't make sense to me, things that I can try to manipulate or, or have weaknesses in. So that's really what it comes down to.